Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our Islam Awareness Month speaker event. Um, Islam Awareness Month has been a great continuing tradition for our Muslim student organization. It's a way for us to shine the light on the beauty of Islam and break down all the negative stereotypes associated with it. We would like to thank our sponsors, Org and The Grind, and we would like to introduce you all to our speaker, Saad Abdullah Evans. Saad Abdullah Evans has studied at... You don't have to give a lengthy bio. So. <laughs> um, my wife, my three children. Um, I did my training at Al Azhar University, Cairo, Egypt, and in Yemen. Uh, and I'm a scholar from the American Learning Institute. Give her a hand for that beautiful. Thank you. Allah reward you. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Um, it's really a great honor and a great uh, privilege, man, to be in your company this afternoon. Uh, I was mentioning to one of the brothers that it's kind of like a career retrospective because when I finished my degree in Egypt in 2012, wow, I'm getting old. Man. Upon the return to the States was Mizzou. And so now to be back and to see that the students, uh, you guys just look younger. Right, of course, because when I initially lectured here, uh, I and the students were close. Uh, nevertheless, um, I think this event is. Uh, it's okay. Bismillah. Is it good now? Okay. I think this event um, is very timely. Um, you know, I always enjoy speaking at Islam Awareness Weeks because it says something about our desire to share our Islam with our Celebrate, um, esteem, um, um, enjoy, just the good company that we You know, too, too often events happen and people focus on the rostrum, the days, right? The, the pulpit. And they forget that the most important connections that are formed at many of these events are the connections you form with each other, right? You don't come just for the speaker to impart some knowledge. You come to enjoy each other's company. And I think that these events answer one of the greatest crises that we have in the American Muslim community. All too often, people in our religious community find themselves very lonely. Um, and so this is really cool. I want to acknowledge uh, the brothers and sisters that organized this event. Uh, my wife is always fond of telling me that getting dressed and talking is nothing that you need to be thanked for. These are things you like to do. On the other hand, the brothers and sisters that worked behind the scenes so that we would have opportunities to sit with each other, to speak with each other, to learn from each other, uh, they really need to be applauded. They really need to be applauded. I understand that this event is really um, about storytelling. Um, I talked to my scheduler. And he told me that they basically want you to talk a little bit about how you found Islam and how Islam found you. And I'll have you know that if it weren't a special occasion, I probably wouldn't want to tell the story because I've told the story to Muslim audiences hundreds of times. You know, they say that converts have this unspoken pact you don't ask me to tell my converse story, I won't ask you to tell your converse story. At the same time, we recognize that people derive a great deal of inspiration 
from convert stories. For some people who were born into Muslim families and who have only ever been Muslim, the idea that a person wasn't a Muslim and then consciously decided to become a Muslim is very intriguing to them. It's very fascinating to them. So tonight, I am going to indulge your intrigue. I am going to indulge your fascination, your interest. Um, I converted to Islam at the age of 16. I was very young. Black young man in Chicago, there were a number of cultural phenomena that made Islam easy for me. One of them was hip hop. You know, some American studies professors, some historians of hip hop music, they say that Islam is the unofficial religion of hip hop, right? The hip hop that I enjoy from Wu-Tang to Nas to Common to Razzcaz, these are people you probably have never heard of, some of them. Um, that music contains a lot of Islamic references. Practicing Muslims. These were not people who went to the masjid, they went to the mosque, or people that fasted in the month of Ramadan, but Islam represented a kind of authentic way of being black, believe it or not. In that cultural expression, Islam was like this thing from across the Atlantic that connected you with your heritage, connected you with your ancestors, and gave you a world of meaning and values that was decidedly not Americans, that was very empowering. So even before I knew what Islam was, I had a certain affinity toward Islam, like a cultural affinity toward Islam, um, which is a lot different than white American converts to Islam. You know, I once did a convert panel at Loyola University in Chicago. And it was me and this brilliant uh, white American sister speaking on the panel. And she told her story first. And I just sat listening in awe and in admiration because she, she was disowned by friends. People thought she joined a cult. People thought she did it because she married somebody out of, she wasn't even married. People would see her in the streets, douse her with holy water, right? Some people thought she was possessed. And somehow this brave woman persevered and retained her faith. And then they asked me to speak after that, like, Brother Obey, can you tell your story? I'm like, when I was listening to Nah. <laughs> then I became Muslim everybody in my community was really proud of me my sister Islam. my best friend's younger brother accepted Islam married my sister but it didn't work out <laughs> you know what I'm saying uh, my grandmother accepted Islam my grandfather accepted Islam. My mother, about a year ago, she accepted Islam. My point is, my conversion story is not simply the outcome of this personal, almost Abrahamic pursuit of the truth. Like you read about Abraham, peace be upon him, that Abraham was pursuing the truth. He saw a star, this is my Lord, then the star set. He saw the moon. This is my And this is certainly my Lord. Then the sun set. And he said, 
I don't worship anything that fades away or sets, but rather I worship the creator of the stars and the moon and the sun. This kind of very intense personal search for the truth. My story really wasn't that this personal intense uh, pursuit. I had the advantage of being Black American and having this cultural kind of connection to Islam or Islamic theme. Right. So when I was in uh, this is where my interest in religion. Oh, you're in the right place. Don't leave me hanging. Don't leave me hanging. You can't leave the speaker hanging. Right. Um, I was playing youth football. And the, the team mom, who would pick all of the players up, I don't know how she was able to squeeze an entire youth football team into her minivan. And if we were pulled over, they probably would take us to jail too. Because we were riding laps and people stuck to the roof of the car. It was crazy. But she was a fervent Christian woman. Her name was Curleen Dorham. And she was Jamaican. She was a. So our games were on Sunday at about one o'clock, but she would pick everybody at eight o'clock, right? We would go to church. She was a Pentecostal woman. And I still remember being in church. And while all of my teammates were playing on their Game Boys, it's kind of like the beta version of Nintendo Switch. It was called Nintendo Game Boy. You know the game, boy. You know the game, boy. Playing Tetris and stuff like that. Um, some people in church, you know, talking to girls, you know, trying to meet girls. Some people sleeping. Some people just goofing off. I actually started to listen. Like, let's, let's see what's going on here. I the message coming from the pulpit that I decided to get baptized on my own. This is at the age of 12. So I had a, a very early interest in religion, right? And then after I was baptized, because my mother, my mother, where's Muhammad that, that, that picked me up from the airport? There he is, mashallah. I was telling Muhammad that my mother, Muhammad is an aspiring doctor, but he graduated with a degree in chemistry. My mother is also a chemist, right? And she wasn't a fervent Christian. I think Christianity was kind of like, um, it was kind of the religion of our admitted Christian woman. Like we never attended church as a family. Uh, you know, we didn't regularly read scripture as a family. So when I decided as a 12 year old that I want to get baptized, it was like a, a very personal decision. And I started attending church. And Ms. Dorham asked me if I wanted to attend Bible study. There was a program called Awanas for Christian youth. I used to attend Awanas. And I started to have some issue with the doctrine of Trinity, right? That there was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And my issue was not that I couldn't understand it. I actually did not believe, even at that time, that I had to understand something in order for it to be true. Something could be true without my understanding it. I believe that now, and I believed that back then. My issue with Trinity, and of course, my language wasn't as polished and sophisticated as a trained, uh, you know, religious scholar. But my issue with it was the historicity. Like, it just didn't seem to be a part of the ministry of Christ himself. Peace be upon him. It didn't seem to be whenever 
didn't see a lot of evidence of Christ preaching the Trinity. There were a few what we would call oblique references here, there, right? God, and the, you know, I and the Father are one. And it just left some, some gaps for me. And so one day when I was like a sophomore, right? Like that, 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 I mean, that's a big jump from eighth grade to a sophomore, but, you know, I kind of attended church every now and again, but was very curious, you know, kind of, kind of searching, listening to my hip hop. You see what I'm saying? And I was in... Suffice it to say, I was there. And like so many young people, I believed that my boredom was punishment or my boredom caused pain to any adult in my presence. This is something silly that kids believe. Like they think that you are agitated by their boredom. And I did too. So my proctor for that day, the man walking up and down the rows, monitoring the students, making sure we weren't talking or playing on our Game Boys or whatever, was a man named Mr. DeVries. I would sigh very loudly. <sighs> like just to let him know how much I didn't want to be there. <sighs> and he said to me, and these words ended up being faithful. He said, Will, and my given name is Will. And I don't mind if you address me as Will, right? Some people call me Obey the Law. Some people call me Will, right? My mother only calls me Will. And my wife only calls me Obey the Law. So hearing them have a conversation in which I'm referenced is the funniest thing you've ever heard. How's Will? Well, Obey is okay, you know. Well, tell Will, I'll tell Obey, you know. Right? And I actually don't mind being addressed as Will. I don't mind being addressed as Obey. Blowing hot air. Why don't you do something useful with your time? And I said, like what, Mr. DeVries? It's Saturday, and I'm here in school with you. What utility am I going to find in that? And we were sitting in the classroom in which uh, AP World Civ was taught. And he grabbed the World Civ book, put it on my desk, and said, read. So for about 15 minutes, I just folded my arms in disdain looking at the book. I'm not reading that crap. I just want to show you how bored I am. I think I'm just going to keep signing. After a while, he wasn't even listening to me anymore, right? So I looked around, I said, I might as well crack it open, see what's in here. And as fate would have it, I opened the book to the Ottoman Empire, as fate would have it. And so I'm just kind of perusing, thumbing through the chapter, and then I come to a small little insert in the chapter that said Ottoman religious life. And emblazoned across the top of the page in bold yellow letters, but God. And I always think to myself, man, am I indebted to that translator? Because if that statement had been translated, there is no God but Allah, I would have said, okay, yeah, I mean, you know, basically Muslims are negating the existence of any other deities except the God they believe in. I would have thought about it in a very idolatrous way. Like, okay, none of those gods are real, but our God is real. Allah, our God. And that wouldn't have uh, piqued my interest. That wouldn't have captivated me. But because it said there is no God but God, the statement was at one and the same time 
How can you negate God and affirm God at the same time? Right? So this made me read. Oh God, but a God. And then I said, Muslims believe that there is one God who is indivisible, who is incomparable, who has no partners, no children, no consort, no peer, no opponent. And with every adjective, I was thinking, that's what I believe in. That, that's what I believe in. That, that, that is what I believe about the nature of the that God is that any co-sharers in his divinity. God does not have a human likeness. God, like, I, that, that's what I believe in. So from that point, my mind was open. I was thinking, hmm, how can I learn a little bit more about Islam? So, I went home and I did something I know none of you have ever done. I picked up an encyclopedia. Those dusty old tomes of yesteryear that used to contain all of this information about the world. And people used to keep libraries in their home bookshelves. It was something like a manual Wikipedia, right? And I pulled the I section and looked up Islam. And the thing that stuck out to me most in this short, very uh, expository, very objective little blurb about Islam was Ramadan, right? They don't eat. As I thought, mm, I had this classmate named Siraj. He was Nigerian, right? I'm very indebted to the Nigerians for my Islam, mashallah. He was Nigerian. His name was Siraj. And I knew that it was like two, three weeks. He wouldn't eat. And I thought, hmm, he's African, right? Again, in my mind, there's this kind of not fully formed connection between Islam and blackness because of Malcolm X, because of the nation of Islam. All of this kind of exists in my mind. It's like fragments. There's hip hop, there's the nation of Islam, there's Farrakhan, there's Malcolm X, there's bean pies, there's bow ties, there's you don't eat pork, there's what I just read about the Ottomans, there's all of this is in my mind. It's just like all of these floating fragments that I can't really piece together. How does all of this fit together? And so I said, I wonder if Sa'ad. Now, quick little discursus, quick little sidebar. When I was in high school, man, with jokes. I was that obnoxious kid roasting everybody, right? If I came to school and I saw you, Anybody could get it. Anybody, teachers, girls, boys, seniors, juniors, sophomores, freshmen. If I saw you, it was on. So when I came to Siraj and I said, hey, yo, Siraj. I'm like, what am I, what am I saying? I, I, gotta, I gotta be authentic. I didn't speak Arabic, right? I didn't say Siraj. Are you a Muslim? And he thought I was setting him up for the punchline of some joke. So he looks like, right? And he's kind of like, kind of like probing my face to see if I'm smirking, if I'm, you know, maybe he was going to say, yeah. Well, Ramadan ain't working for you, homie, because you need to lose weight, partner. You know, he was trying to see what I was going to do. So I, he said, yeah. I said, bro, I want to learn about Islam. Can you teach me something? <laughs> <laughs> right? 
Learn your religion. He said, I don't know anything about Islam, bro. I just do it my, some days my father tells me, son, you can't eat lunch. And I said, okay, you know, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He said, but if you come over to my house after school, my father, now my father, he can tell you something about Islam, right? And so I went to his house after school and brother Hakeem Adebayo, um, he said to me, how does your mother feel about you exploring different religions? And I said, well, my mother, she's very open-minded. She encourages me to read, to explore, you know, to satisfy my curiosity about things. He felt about it, but that's what I said. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. She wouldn't mind any of this. About Islam. We talked for about 45 minutes. And I don't know what it was, but I was like leaping out of my chair. Like, I, I believe this. I, I believe this. I was 16. And he said to me, you want to you wanna take your shahada? I didn't know what that was. But, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm in the moment. It's, I'm going with it. I'm like, yes. I will take my sh shahada. Yes, let's do this. And right there, I took my shahada. I was 16. I had no idea what I was doing. No idea what I was doing. And because, now this is going to strike you as humorous, but this is the real story. That night, I felt like I did something special, but I didn't know what I had done. Humorously, he gave me two things when I converted. He gave me a crocheted knitted cap, a topi or a kufi, and he gave me a miswack, a little wooden stick. I had no idea what the stick was. I just thought like it was some like sacred relic of Islam. You know, I used to take the miswack and sit it in my room on my, you know, nightstand. <laughs> Somehow, this little piece of wood means something to Muslims. But I don't know what it means. And sometimes I would just put it in my pocket. And I would tell people, like, you know, man, the other day, man, I, I did something crazy. They're like, what? I became a Muslim. Man, get the hell out of here. You didn't become no Muslim. Like, yeah, I did. I pull out the stick. <laughs> Bro. Broski, I became a Muslim and they gave me this, man. I don't know what the way like, yo, what is it? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> he just said, but I'm telling you, I'm Muslim, right? Uh, the funny story about the Kufi or the Topi is one day I was like, um, I'm going to go to school and wear this. And of course, if I'm the man with the jokes roasting everybody, you know I was known for my fashion. You know, man, on the, on the, on the drip side, your boy was mean. I was tough on the drip side. Ooh, vicious. So for me to come out and wear this crocheted knitted cap, that was going to be a big deal. People were going to notice. So I was like working myself up to it for like weeks. One day, you know what really brought levity to the whole situation? One of my classmates saw me and said, well, I didn't know you were Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I laughed and it just made the whole thing. I said, no, nah, man, Muslim, Muslim, Muslim. He said, okay, that's what's up, my brother. Yeah. Hi, right, brother. You know, but I went home that night, right? And from the movie Malcolm X, the movie that was released in 1992, that Spike Lee, uh, you know, wrote and produced and directed, rather, um, I knew that a part of the Muslim prayer involved putting your head on the ground because there was like this evocative scene in the movie. 
didn't know that they were performing this kind of very specific kind of ritual prayer that you had to watch to prepare for and face Mecca and say specific things. I thought they were just supplicating, making do I like I was taught to pray as a Christian, but you just do it as a Muslim with your head on the ground. So that night before bed, because I used to always pray before I went to sleep at night, I put my head on the ground and I was praying. And my mother opened the door because she didn't know what I had done. She said, boy, what the hell are you doing? I looked up and said, I'm trying to pray. She said, oh, okay. And closed my room door. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I want you to, you know, it, it doesn't happen. And I don't, how much time do I have? Oh, my God, I, have, I actually have a great deal of time. Wow. Oh, 615 is good to stop. Okay. So for a while, I didn't know anything about Islam. I just knew that I had accepted Islam. You know, I think sometimes when we tell the story, we never tell the story of our transformation, our becoming. Shout out to Michelle Obama. You know what I'm saying? Right? We just tell the story like, I accepted my, uh, I took my shahada. Or something. No, no. For like a year, I took shahada, but I wasn't like going to the mosque. I wasn't, making my five daily prayers. I wasn't fasting in Ramadan. I really didn't know any Muslims besides Siraj. He didn't know anything about Islam. So when we saw each other, it was just like, you know, you know what I'm saying? You know what happened in your kitchen that day, you know what I'm saying? But that was about the extent. Of, we, didn't, we didn't even say salam, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We didn't say like salam alaykum. We were like, come on, man. How pious do you think we were in high school? Like, salam alaykum, wa alaykum, salam, rahmatullah. It was just like this kind of like, remember what I did in your kitchen that day? And that was it. So one day, um, so I said, you know, uh, we're out of school tomorrow and my father might take me with him uh, to Juma, to the Nigerian Islamic Association. Uh, you want to go? And I couldn't go because I had something I had to do. I'm going to stay in the city. I had something I had to do back uh, near my house. But it made me look, again, something I'm sure none of you have ever done, in the yellow pages. I looked in the yellow pages to find a mosque. And it was in a town called Frankfurt, Illinois. And I said, you know what? Tomorrow, I'm going to go to Juma. Yeah, what time the service started. But based on, you know, cultural frame of reference, religious services started at 9 o'clock, 9 a.m. So I showed up at that address using MapQuest, right, with the, the directions printed out. I showed up at that address at 9 a.m. The parking lot was completely empty. And I said, man, these Muslims, they have no respect. I would dress for church. And I was sitting, I was waiting. Had my stick with me. <laughs> now it's 10 a.m. About this story, the thing that's really touching about it, I wouldn't leave. Nobody's there. I said, they told me they do pray on Friday. And I am a Muslim, so, you know, I got, I got to wait. 11 a.m., nobody's there. I've been there two hours, sitting there all by myself. Hmm. 12 noon, nobody's there. Hmm. At about 12.15, the first person comes, right? He says to me, can I help you? I pull out my stick. I'm a Muslim.
and uh, I'm here to um, attend uh, surgery. He said, when did you get here? I said, I was on time. I what slowed everybody else down? Right? I was here at nine o'clock. And oh man, it's, you know the beautiful thing about this story. And you don't hear these. You don't hear these kinds of stories these days. This was a Desi man. He was Indian, and you would have thought that this man and I would probably have nothing in common, nothing. But he was so kind to me. He was so gentle to me. I'm getting emotional as I think about. It. scared me from Muslim assemblies or congregational spaces. I'll never forget, he said to me, he said, you know, when we come for this Friday prayer, the first person that comes gets the reward of sacrificing a camel. The next person that comes then a sheep. Then all the way down to the last person that comes gets the reward of sacrificing an egg. He looked at me and said, today, you got big one, big, big, big. <laughs> you know? I felt very good about that. I said, I got, I got a big one. It's very good. So we went in. You gonna pray your sunnah? I said, yeah. Let's pray our let's sunnah. Let's, let's, let's just do it. And he made takbir al ihram. He said Allahu Akbar, the opening takbir. And I did the same thing. He folded his hands and I folded mine. And I looked right at him like this. Okay. And I was actually like saying to myself when he would do something, like he would bow and say, okay, okay. He would come back up, okay, okay. Then he would go down. Oh, this is oh, this is how this works, right? But when I went into sujood, I couldn't see him. You know, like how people are shown displaying their adoration to a king, or right. So when he finished, and I looked up, and you know, I finished. He said, "We're praying, not swimming." Right. Then he, he gave me a hug. He said, We're praying, not swimming. And then he took me by the hand and he walked me into the library of the mosque and he gave me a book and it says, Prayer for Children by an author named Hulam Sawar. It's called Prayer for Children. And he said, Take this. And he, and he gave it to me. And I sat through that service. I didn't understand anything they were saying, not the English. I was just looking like, you know, which, 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 you know, just to make a point, and I get it. They were a very uh, South Asian insular community, a South Asian Muslim community. What they were talking about was probably relevant to their community in some way. It wasn't relevant to me. And I think that we have to make a decision as a Muslim community do we want to do something that is relevant to our neighbors? Or don't we, right? Because even when we name our centers, see, if you say the mosque of greater Columbia or the mosque of downtown Columbia, that mosque of my area. If I want to come in and see what's happening there, I guess I can. I mean, this is Columbia. I'm from Columbia. I was born in Colum raised in Columbia. This is the mosque of Columbia. I guess I can go in and go. I know what they do at the different church communities in Columbia. What do they do here? But if you call it Masjid Dil Jalali Wal Ikram, what that says to a non-Muslim or a, 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 you know, a, you know, one of my one of my friends, he says, don't say non-Muslim. Non is a type of bread. There are no non-people. Say people of other faiths or no faith, right? What that says to a person of uh, another faith is keep out. 
come in, we are going to be talking about things that you have no context for. We are going to be speaking in languages you don't understand. And this is just not for you. How will the person um, come to see Islam as something they could have a relationship with if our centers are run and administered in that way? Right? I didn't understand anything they were saying. But I said, okay. I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't the spiritually uplifting talk that I expected. But it was very special. Right? Just looking at the Arabic calligraphy around the mosque, smelling the smells of like oud, like itr. I remember somebody shaking my hand and me saying, Muslims spray. They wear insect spray for cologne. This is very interesting, <laughs> you know. And that, that scent was on my hand for like a week. You know, I'm like, what the? Right? You know, smelling the different spices of the foods that people either ate or, you know, were selling. And it was all very exotic and very authentic. Like, man, this is, this is, I, I can't believe I'm here as like a 16, 17 year old kid, like just sitting here experiencing this. And I went home. The transliteration, meaning the Arabic script, put into English letters for like seven or eight consecutive hours, trying to get my mouth around those words. And, and in those seven hours, I learned how to pray. I memorized every part of the prayer. I learned sort of the Fatiha, but of course not with like Fatiha, but like Fatiha, right? I learned... Surah Al-Ikhlas, right? And I learned uh, Surah Al-Kawthar. I learned Al-Kawthar so I could pray. And that was like the beginning of my journey. You know, that was like the beginning. As uh, I got more into it, I started to make Jum'ah more. I... Uh, started to, to read books. I started to go online and see what, you know, Muslims were talking about. I began to kind of gain some, you know, Islamic acculturation. And I said, hmm, if I really want to learn this religion, I need to learn the Arabic language, right? If I really want to learn this religion. And so I started, you know, studying Arabic, really just personally, just personal study, whatever resources I could access. And I enjoyed it so much. Even though I was at Columbia and my mother, just to give you some context, my mother was the first member of our family to go to college. And, um, uh, you know, a college education was like the sine qua non. In Latin, that means the thing without which something cannot exist of being a black middle-class person. Like being serious about education, being serious about school, um, being a distinguished student. That was like, a, that was like an ideal that our family esteemed. That very seriously. Um, so when I started getting this idea about studying Islam, you know, I was scared to mention that to my mother. You know, it's like, you know, mom, I'm enjoying school, but I kind of want to study Islam. And my mother said the same thing that one of your parents would say. Now, how the hell are you going to get a job doing that? <laughs> Studying Islam. What, 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 I mean, what, what is that? And so I just kind of like, okay, just, you know, relinquish the idea. But it kept coming back and it kept coming back and I kept nagging her. It 
if it's what you really, really want to do, I don't want to deprive you of that. But I don't want you to go overseas. I don't want you to go overseas, right? Is there any place that you can engage this Islamic study, but locally? And there was a small school called IIE, the Institute of Islamic Education. It was about 35, 40 minutes outside of Chicago. And um, uh, I just showed up there, went to the director of the school and told him, I'm a Muslim. I didn't have to stick. By now I knew they use this to clean their teeth. <laughs> By now I knew that. Natural toothbrush. How anachronistic. Just use a toothbrush. Why, why use a stick? You know, okay, like a natural toothbrush, right? And I said, um, I would like to study here. I'm a, a new Muslim. Um, I don't know a lot, but I'm very sincere about wanting to learn this religion and I don't have any money. But if you let me sleep, this is a boarding school. If you let me sleep in the boiler room, I will be the hardest working student that has ever come through your doors. And he looked at me and he said, you don't have to sleep in the boiler room, <laughs> but you can come to school here. And that was, I started out memorizing the Quran and I had to do the Qaeda, right? You know, learning the Arabic letters. And that was hard, man. Like that was hard. I was, whoa. And all the kids would be looking. I was older than most of the other kids there. They were all like young, young boys. It was a kutan. It was like a, you know, uh, an elementary school, right? And I would see them. They would be there in front of the most half and all of me rocking back and forth, you know, memorizing the Quran. And I wasn't even reading, but I would just rock like they were rocking. I don't know how this somehow, you know, uh, you know, inhibits this is what they do here. <laughs> you know, my teacher would call me up. You know, pedal, 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 pedal. Read, read. I don't know how to read. <laughs> he said, "What? Are you? I see you going like this." I said, That's what everybody else is doing. They're going like this. So you know. So I stayed there for about two years. Mashallah. I learned a lot of the fundamentals of uh, Arabic and I memorized a good amount of the Quran. And I started to really kind of understand my religion. Um, you know, um, I really wanted to immerse myself in Arabic. So I withdrew from school there and I moved to Yemen, right? I moved to Hadramaut. When I Um, the first place I traveled outside of the U.S. And I left in December. And so I had like this, this parka with fur on the hood. When I got off the plane in Yemen, man, they looked at me like I was like an explorer. So they was like, where, where have you come from? I said, America. <laughs> he said, he said my God, is it, is it that cold? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I had like this huge coat. And I lived in Yemen uh, for about six months, you know, in this Arabic intensive. Oh, before that, my um, my wife learned that she was pregnant right before to go to Yemen together. And she's like, well, wait, I am not doing my first pregnancy in a developing country. Forget that. But I don't want to stop you from doing this. So go for just, you know, six months, come back for the last trimester. I said, okay. And then we'll all go back together as a family. I went to Yemen and there's a joke. They say if Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam, returned to earth, the only place he would recognize is Yemen. Because it hasn't changed that, that much, you know. And I, and I, and I, and I love, I love Yemen. I love people of Yemen, inshallah. 
um, very kind, very generous, uh, very devout, uh, very, just, just very beautiful uh, people. But I knew this is probably not the best place for my family. You know, my wife wasn't a student. Uh, she was really just supporting me. And I thought she would probably thrive in a place where there was at least a few movie theaters. Because we were in like Fil Aryaf, Fil Yemen, in the rural, right? In Tarim, in Hadramaut. We weren't like in Sana'a. I said, she would probably thrive in a place where there were at least a few shopping malls, a few. And someone said Cairo. So I ended up traveling to Cairo. Um, I enrolled at Al Azhar. Um, I was at Azhar for about five years. Um, I enrolled at the, in the Sharia program in Azhar. Um, I graduated from Azhar in 2012. Uh, that was difficult, man. Doing a law degree in a non-European language. Whew. That really, because I, I did Sharia. I did Sharia, Islamia, Sharia, I wasn't Kanu. That really, that really pushed me to my limit. Um, but mashallah, I did, I did a degree in Islamic law. Um, I returned um, and started. the American Learning Institute for Muslims. And today I'm in Columbia, Missouri. So, mashallah. So that's, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. I wanted to end at six, so that you have at least 30 minutes to engage, you know, questions, comments, ideas, um, anything that I didn't touch upon, anything you'd like me to touch upon, um, Bismillah, we have a half an hour, and uh, consider me an open book. You can speak up, or you can just scan the QR code right there. Anything. Yeah, we have some questions rolling in. Um, the first one says, what tips do you have for learning Arabic for non-Arabic speakers? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. You know, um, human beings are language-making creatures. <laughs> you know, God mentions that it is a divinely inspired trait of human beings that we naturally produce language. The difference between young learners and adult learners of languages is that young learners of languages, they just speak. They just speak, speak, speak. They don't care if they make mistakes. Um, they even uh, form their own verb conjugations. Like, you know, my five-year-old or my six-year-old, she'll just say, Dad, you buy to me that. And I have to say, no, kid, it's bought. But she'll just, like, her mind, she'll just work with language, just naturally, making connections. What I find with um, adults is that we're very reserved with language, right? We don't want to sound silly. Uh, we don't want to embarrass ourselves. So we don't speak. I would say... Get a good teacher, enroll in a good program, and then just speak. 
when I was in that early period of my Arabic learning, I mean, I would just speak. I would read out loud. Whenever I was reading, I would read aloud and I would just speak to whoever wanted to talk to me. Anybody just, just talking, speaking, speaking, speaking. And after some time, um, you know, um, the language started to make sense. You know, um, when I first began, it was like climbing a mountain. I mean, I, I still remember one of my teachers trying to explain like basic sentence structure to me. And this took like two days. And I'm sitting there, he's like, you understand? No, right? This language, I just wasn't made to do it, right? But I just doggedly just persisted. And then one day I was reading and I maybe read three or four pages without consulting a dictionary. I just started jumping up and down. Oh my God, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And my wife was like, you fool, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm reading, I'm reading and I, I don't have to use the dictionary. This is amazing, this is amazing. And after that, basic comprehension became like sliding down the mountain. But Arabic is Lugat al Arabiya Bahar. So it's an ocean. So even now, uh, lots of poetry. Shia, just uh, whenever I'm reading poetry, I'm just muhayya, just confused. So a lot of poetry still kind of uh, challenges me. Um, a lot of spoken dialects of Arabic. If anybody here is Moroccan, I'm just like, I'm like, they're like, you understand what I'm saying? No. Egyptian Arabic, I can understand because I lived in Egypt. Right? I lived in Egypt for five years. Now, but I can't speak Egyptian Arabic. You know, I can give, you know, Muhammad can tell you, I can give like a word here, a word there. But I really speak classical Arabic. Right? I speak fosha. I speak classical Arabic. So my classical Arabic so they wouldn't jack the prices up on me. Right? If you say anything in classical Arabic, they know he's not from here. Charge him double. Right? And I would try my but like a few minutes in they would be like, no, you're not, you're not. Did I say 14? I meant 28. Right? So um Arabic is still a very challenging language. Mashallah. All right. Um the next question says how did you feel when you became Muslim? I felt I felt purposeful and renewed. And um, I also felt very authentically black. I felt like, you know, uh, I've done something that, that connects me with where I come from. His father being Nigerian, um, you know, I felt, you know, now of course, you know, after scholarship and, you know, uh, a lot of exposure to the Muslim community, learning of the very strained relationship that a lot of, um, you know, uh, Black Muslims experience with the greater Muslim community, learning how even African Muslims, uh, you, know, you know, some of the greatest historical contributors to our Islamic legacy and heritage are consistently marginalized in Islamic studies, Islamic studies departments. Of course, I didn't know any of that when I was. I'm Nigerian, I'm Muslim and I'm black. You know what I'm saying? I felt, I felt very authentically black. Um, I felt special, you know, like I felt like I had uh, open the door to this world that many people my age, not only were they unaware that it existed, they weren't even concerned about things like that. You know, they just, they just weren't concerned about things like that. So I felt like there was like this unique and special part of me that um, I was... 
And besides, I got to walk around with a little stick, you know, that, that, that somehow suggested that I was connected to this new world, you know. And it, it all just felt, you know, it all, it all felt really cool. You know, there's a professor, Su'ad Abdul Khabir, has a book called Muslim Cool. Uh, I suggest you all read it. You know, it kind of talks about the connection of Islam and hip hop. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, kind of where that, you know, maps onto the larger story of Islam in Black America. Uh, I think I had a lot of a lot of experiences that, you know, she explores very well, you know, in that book. And how did your parents feel when you accepted? Again, man, uh, out of me. Um, you know, um, African Americans. Um, have a certain cultural affinity for Islam, towards Islam. You know, Islam represents many, thing in, many things in Black communities. Most of them are positive. Some of them are poked fun at, right, from the Nation of Islam, bow ties, bean pies, um, people that are um, uh, conspicuously over-articulate using all kinds of fancy words. Listen, my brother, we got to fight the industrial complex of the, uh, you know, like there's some of them are parodied, right? But much of them, uh, much of those things represent um, pride. Women, um, uh, being clean, having good hygiene, um, having good diction, having good posture. These are some of the cultural associations that we make you know, with Islam as African-American. So I think that my, my mother, um, I didn't really grow up with my father, um, but my mother really thought, you know, this, this, this should mean something really positive for you. You know, this should, um, this should help you, you know, gain some perspective and some focus uh, as a young man developing in the world. So they were very, you know, they're very happy actually, you know? Yes. So you mentioned the beginning now i now i now i did i mean from that church community i did encounter some pushback it wasn't everybody you know didn't uh they didn't sing uh, uh <laughs> when i you know when i converted to islam um um uh, uh, a pastor named Reverend Williams. And Reverend Williams was like, uh, he wasn't the pastor at Miss Dorham's church, but he was the pastor at our local church. And somebody told him that I had converted to Islam. I don't even know if you could our lunch sat down next to me and started uh, know, uh, ministering to me, uh, evangelizing, and um, basically you know, telling me that I could my um, shahada. And, you know, I, I argued with him, I mean, not very skillfully, but to be a junior or a senior in high school and having any kind of intellectual exchange with an adult by the time we finished at the end of lunch, the entire school was cheering for me. <laughs> you know? And they were mostly Christian, but they were just like, dang. You know? For some of them, it was just a, uh, like it was like a youthful rebellion. I don't think they had any um, concern about Islam, but cool, like, dang, we kind of like a rebel, you know what I'm saying? So. Uh, you know, there was some pushback from elders in my community. Um, um, there was a lot of admiration among some of my friends. And then, too, I mean, I don't want to paint an overly, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, picturesque kind of portrait. You know, this was Chicago. Um, a lot of my friends around the time that I embraced Islam were really just getting 
to gangbang. Many of them just beginning to enter the drug trade. Many of them just beginning their experimentation in alcohol. So a lot of people kind of looked at it like, well, at least your kind of maturation from, you know, a boy to a man is, you know, something positive, right? That was still very much a part of our kind of community. It's like, how angry could you really be at me for becoming a Muslim? If you're like an adult in my community, <laughs> your son just became a gangster disciple, right? Your son just became a vice lord. I mean, how angry could you really be at me for, I, I just became a Muslim, right? I mean, if you're gonna preach, I just started carrying little sticks. Right, so you you also had that, you know. I mean, you you also had that dynamic. Um, was there anyone that treated you differently? And is there any advice that you have on spreading Islam to your non-Muslim friends? You know, man, this is a really good question. You know, I I was, you know, a lot of people that embrace Islam are kind of like social misfits. They're like people who never really fit in. And becoming Muslim just kind of like cements their outsider status. Like now it's over. I was actually, and I, and I say this, of course, this is my, 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 my own opinion of myself. I was a really cool, like the esteem of my classmates. I was, I, I'll say this emphatically. I was not a lame. I was like, I was like cool. You know, when I dress nice, you know, I, you know, uh, I talk, you know, I knew how to talk. I was actually a, a good student, but I could like get off the bus, take my sweat off, talk slick to the street guys. You know what I mean? Uh, I thought I had really good taste in hip hop. You know, uh, I hung around the barbershop. So the older guys taught me how to talk to girls. You know what I mean? You know, I was, I was like a cool kid and I enjoyed that esteem. And when I became Muslim, one of the biggest challenges was that any effort on my Islam, they just knew that I wasn't Muslim. They treated me like I had joined a cult or like, you know, I was like this righteous brother, you know, instead of Will, they started calling me Brother Will. You know, it was like, it was like something to, 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 to uh, make a caricature. It's like, our peaceful brother, Brother Will, right? And I had some friends that I was on the basketball team with. And one night, they were going to get together. Uh, it was during the season, and I was Muslim. And I went into my friend's basement, and they had some alcohol sitting on the floor. And when they saw me, they put the alcohol behind the couch, right? And the strangest thing, Right, because I didn't want to feel like I was killing their vibe. I say, look, look, I'm Muslim and I don't drink, but whatever y'all do, do you, man. It's not, it's not like that. Whatever you do. And I told an older brother about this. And he said, You shouldn't have done that. Something about your presence reminded them about Allah. Something about your presence made them want to be godly. Why would you stop that? I said, yeah, you know, you're right, man. Something about my presence made them want to conceal the alcohol. Right? You know, something that was um, deep connected my Islam at this time to a lot of the, in my mind, a lot of the teachings of the nation of Islam as well before I really got clear on like the Aqidah of Sunni Islam. So like respect for women, respect for black women especially, was like also a part of my conversion to Islam. So like when my friends would sit around and they would talk about girls and they would call girls out of their names, call them Bs, call them Hs, I would say like, nah, man, you shouldn't, you shouldn't talk about our women like that, man. Nah, bro, don't do, don't do that, brother. Don't do that, brother. And so, that became a thing. So like guys would see each other, yo man, where the women at? You know, they would look 
where are the women, brother Will, brother Will, right, at the football game. And so, so my point is, they would make a, you know, they would make a, they would make a thing of it, you know, make a thing. And it was something I just had to get used to. Like, I had to learn to wear that as my jacket, even though I knew I'm not like this ultra pious guy that spends all night in prayer and reads scripture all day. But I have committed myself to Islam and I'm still in high school. And I realized that makes me an anomaly to my classmates. And I just, I just got to roll with it. I just got to deal with it, you know. And I just, I just learned to deal with it. And so like, when I would see that stuff, I wouldn't say, pull the alcohol back out. You know, I would just embrace it. Here, so I know I, I know y'all want to do y'all drinking. Y'all can do it as soon as I leave. But I'm just checking in with my boys, seeing what's going on. Right? They would be sitting there, kind of looking at the clock, knowing they got some girls coming over, looking at the clock. Like, man, are you leaving or what? Why y'all want me to leave so bad? Huh? Why y'all want me to leave so bad? Huh? Why y'all want me to leave so bad? Now nah, I'm gonna get out y'all way, man. I'll see y'all later. <laughs> you know, so I just had to embrace it, man. I just had to embrace it. You know, um, how would you advise someone navigating constricting parents who will not support where they want to explore? And um, what advice would you give someone who is learning, trying to start, uh, you know, convert to Islam? All kind, you know, it's weird, man. It's really weird because my mother gave me the space to convert to Islam. And not only did she not discourage me, she didn't even guilt me. She didn't even say like, oh, I can't believe you're doing this. And it's weird because I know I could not offer the same thing to my children. It's just, it's just, a, it's a weird, it's weird. If one of my children told me they wanted to explore a different religion, I would be very hurt by that. I would say, oh man, you know, I, I, I have always prayed that you would find the beauty in Islam that I do. You know, I've always prayed for that. And the fact that you... But, and this is where I realized I might be more liberal, more American than some of my uh, colleagues among scholars. But I realized, there's no compulsion in religion. And you can't be forced to believe in something. You can't, I can't, you can't be, you know, this ayah of the Quran, la ikraha fi deen, this is not in shah. Allah is not saying, la tukrihu nas ala islamihim. Allah is not saying, don't force people to be Muslim. Allah is actually saying, la ikraha fi deen. You cannot make somebody believe in something. You can make them pretend to believe something to appease you. So to any parents, Muslim parents, Christian parents, Jewish parents, humanist parents, I think the only thing we can say to our children is the truth. I love this religion. I want you to find in it what I find. The fact that you don't really, really hurts me. Like it hurts me. Like I'm, 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 I'm hurt by this but I realize you have to make a decision about who you are and what you believe and how you want to meet God when you die and I would say to anybody that wants to talk to their parents they have to press upon them that I don't, I don't want to disrespect you. I don't want to offend you. I don't want to hurt you. But I have to do what I believe is right. And if that means embracing Islam, that's what I intend to do. If that means leaving Islam, and please, none of you leave Islam if you're Muslim. That's not what I'm saying. Right? I am not saying to leave Islam. Right? That's not what I'm saying. Again, you know, uh, I, I think I might be in like a stupor for you. 
I might be like, they'd be like, man, he had a, a, a thriving career. What happened? Man, subhanAllah, because of Allah. Man, he's, he's, been un, he's been unable to speak for like two years. Right? I'm like, I'm, I'm really, I love this religion. So I'm not saying leave Islam. But if a person decides that this is not what they believe, then they shouldn't do it for anybody else. The Quran says, فَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُؤْمِنْ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَكْفُرَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants to believe, then believe. And whoever wants to disbelieve, then disbelieve. Right? This is our religion. I'm sorry. I would say to anybody, every human being has the responsibility of following their own conscience and their own conviction. Everybody. And you have to, um, now, my conscience and my conviction is that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of Allah. And anything that can be shown to authentically come from him, I accept as absolute truth. That is my conviction. So I don't want you to think that in any way I'm suggesting anything watered down. You know, I'm Muslim with a capital M. But I'm saying you have to do what you believe in. Right? And God will be the judge. Right? I hope I'm being understood clearly. Right? The miss what? <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, you know, it's interesting, man. I not only have I embraced Islam, but I've learned Islam. I've lived in Muslim majority countries for years. So at this point, it's weird, man. It's like, so when I was in the Madrasa in Elgin, Illinois, it was a mostly South Asian uh, Madrasa. So I got a chance to really experience that, that South Asian acculturation. Eat my, my biryani, my khimu, my alu palak, right? right. I've, I've, I've listened to the teachers tell stories in Urdu and have somebody translate for me. I can understand basic Urdu commands and some, some terms, some language. Um, so none of that culture is foreign to me. I've lived in Yemen. I've lived in Egypt, right? None of that culture is foreign to me. However, exposure to those cultures that made me really appreciate and love my own, right? It was, it was exposure to those cultures that led me to the conclusion I am Muslim, but I'm never going to be Arab. I mean, I'm Musta'arif. I speak Arabic, but I'm never going to be Arab. And so it led me to this radical, because at first, you know, I mean, I went through stages. You know, each time I was in a place, I would embrace the acculturation of that place so fully that I almost started speaking English with an accent. You know, waving my head like this. No, brother. No, no, no. You know, right? No, no. Acha, acha, acha. Right? I would, you know, move to Egypt and time something happened. Yes, salam. Yes, salam. Yes, salam. Right? Allah. Right? I moved, you know. After those experiences, hold on. Right? يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّا خَنَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكْرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمُ الْخَبِيرُ Oh humanity, we created you from one male and one female and we spread you into nations and tribes so that you would recognize one another which means in order to recognize one another we should preserve our cultural distinctiveness so I had to, it took me like years to get to this place like I am Muslim, I embrace my tradition, I uphold the Sharia, I uphold
Prophet والسلام, but I am a black man and I love myself. You know, I don't, my culture is like a contradiction to Islam. I don't think that everything about who I was before I was Muslim is bad. The foods I used to like, the entertainment I used to appreciate, the ways that I used to dress, these are all consistent with Islam. So it took me a while to get to that point, man. But I'm, I'm really happy I did. Inshallah, I think it's, 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 it's made me appreciate my Islam a lot more than I would have if I was kind of like a, a, like a muntahid, which in Arabic means like... I was like, a, like, a, like an impersonator of somebody Arab. Would have nourished me very long, so I'm really, I'm really glad I, I kind of found myself, you know, in my Islam. And some of my colleagues, who I don't think they're lost or anything like that, but many of them, mashallah, you know, they still wear imam, they still wear turban all the time, they still wear jalabi. I wear jalabi sometimes. Right? I don't always wear jacket and tie, right, when I'm teaching. Um, but I'm very comfortable wearing a jacket and tie as well. And some of them see me and they're just like. How will anybody know that you're a person of knowledge if you dress like that? I guess I have to display some knowledge. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah, man. Azhar was subhanAllah. It was different. It was different than Mizzou. I assure you that. Um, you know, being an Azhar was kind of like seeing a diamond in the rough, right? The society does not appreciate the ilm al -shara. They don't appreciate the ulum islamiyya. take final exams, exit exams in high school. The highest score is going to medicine and engineering. Then, right, in descending order, the lowest score is going to religious studies, right? So you find in these departments, the students with the dimmest prospects, uh, the least inspiring, the least inspired, um, the least uh, naturally gifted and talented, the least hardworking. And so the culture of education in Azhar is a culture of takhalluf, right? It, I mean, a, a culture of, uh, what's that? Close-mindedness Close and, and, and backwardsness and uh, a lack of productivity. Very sincere. Many of them are still very skilled. And it is still the Azhar. Like it has a, a prestige. You know, I always say to people, yeah, that's hard. a bad 100 years doesn't, doesn't remove a good thousand, right? A bad, a bad century doesn't, re doesn't remove a good, you know, millennium. I mean, Azhar has been a degree-granting institution for a thousand years, right? So it has a, it has a, a you know, a ro'ah, it has a, you know, a, a haiba, it has a prestige, it has a grandeur that at times you can still, you know, you can still detect it. You know, you know, and Azhar, I always joke with people, you know, we don't say that Azhar is, you know, the see what I'm saying, you know, right? So it has, it, it still has a certain prestige. You know, you still have families from everywhere as far afield as Indonesia to Nigeria who send their children to the Azhar, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, so so some of that culture is there um, because the the state and it's a state-run institution, right? They don't have any outcasts, they don't have endowments, so there's no there's no scholastic independence for those scholars. It's a state-run institution. The state does not invest in the institution, so a lot of it is in disrepair, it's falling apart. much better 
So some of the teachers are a bit frustrated. Some of them teach at us how to drive taxis. Right? This is embarrassing. Nothing embarrassing about driving a taxi. But to be a college professor and not be able to feed your family on that salary alone is embarrassing, not for you, but the people paying you should be embarrassed, right? Um, so it's, it's tough. And because of that, that lack of investment in the institution, the bureaucracy is like from the Stone Age, man. You know, I, I still remember going in to get my transcript. They said, you have to go to Shu'un at Talaba. You have to go to student affairs. There was one man sitting in an office with papers everywhere. And I said, Anna, Willie Wills, Yvonne, a third. My given, my given name, I'm a third. Egyptians just love that. Every time I would say, a thalith, the third, they would say, Zayl Muluk, yani. Like kings. Are you, are you royalty? I say, no, it's, it's, it's a common thing in America that one would be named after his father and his grandfather. So I would say, Anna Willie Wills, he founds a fan in America, from America. He would say, and just grab a folder and just pull it out and give me my trade. I'm like, that was amazing, you know? So, I mean, no computers. All of the administrators are like, something, they say, Tigi Bokro. They just keep drinking their tea. It's, 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 it's really tough from that perspective. But if you want the knowledge, it's there, right? Everything is going to move at a very slow pace. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not this kind of romantic experience of sitting in the great majalis of ilm, sitting in the great circles of knowledge. It's not, it's, not, it's not that kind of experience, but you will learn. And if you take your mukarra, you take your uh, curricular work seriously, you will leave with a very broad, very rich understanding of Islam. You will get that. They a lot of clouds of cigarette smoke and, you know, uninspired students and, you know, people cheating you with bad food and stuff like that too, right? But um, it's, 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 you know, I like to say the juice is worth the squeeze. The juice is worth the squeeze. What I experienced there, I do it 10 more times to learn what I learned there. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, in 10 minutes, we're going to go pray Maghrib downstairs in the basement. Uh, but the next question asked, what, was there ever an ayah from the Quran that stuck with you as you were learning? Oh. Yes, I mean, I think probably Ayaz al Kursi, you know, it was something about Ayaz al Kursi that Allah, uh, la ilaha illahu, you know, it was just, you know, God, there is nothing worthy of worship except He. I don't know, man. It was it was just like this um, this proclamation of what divinity actually is that even now still stirs me uh, quite a great deal in my soul. Support of Black and African American Muslims in our community, given the current climate in American culture. You know, Bismillah. I think that that question. Is, is quite a loaded one in that, you know, support kind of presupposes that you are in a superior position and someone else is in a, uh, an inferior position. And you're asking yourself, how can I support you? Whereas solidarity, sisterhood, brotherhood, community actually entails us meeting on equal footing. Now, I won't hide the fact that it 
is a mostly working class, mostly, right? Um, however, just because people are working class does not mean they want to be patronized. Nobody wants to be patronized. Nobody wants to be, you know, how can we help you along? No, no. If you want to form a relationship of brotherhood with me, then come and pray with me and invite me to pray with you. Come and benefit from the resources I have to offer and allow me to benefit from the resources you have to offer. Respect my experience. I'll respect your experience. Let's converse. Let's have a conversation. Respect my culture. I'll respect your culture. Interrogate yours together. This is what I think we really seek from each other. Not these relationships that imply these very unhealthy uh, hierarchies. Like how can I, how you little black Muslim, how can I pull you up? No, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in that. But if you want to worship God together, I think this will be a beautiful expression of the universality of Islam, right? But how can we get to a place where we can see each other as people who can worship God together, right? How many stories um, have you been exposed to in the news media that you have to forget that you have you know, connect with me on a basis of, of, of mutual respect. And I think that all of us need that. Like we need, it's not just that because um, uh, many immigrant Muslim communities, and even using the term immigrant, I mean, most of you were born in this country. Maybe, how many of you were born in this country? Almost all of you were born in this country. So even saying immigrant Muslims, you're not immigrants. But even when we're talking about, you know, Muslims of, of other cultural backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds and, you know, uh, African-American and Black, you know, Muslims. Um, we, should, we should really seek relationships through which we can just powerful just to get to know one another. Sometimes we over plan the agenda. It's like, okay, if we're going to come together with Black Muslims, should we invite somebody from BLM? If we're gonna come together for black Muslims, should we do like a clothing drive, a food drive, a legal clinic? What about just sharing some food and talking about our lives? How about that? Can we just get together and talk? How about that? And then maybe out of that effort to just pray together some very substantive initiatives and programs and things like that that are mutually beneficial. You see, because something like that or there would be mutual benefit. So good in just being like confined to a suburban, mostly white enclave where you're not exposed to the richness of American society. This would be a great benefit for you to come into the inner city, see our communities, see how life functions here. This would be a great benefit to you. And it would be a great benefit to us if we can share best practices, share financial resources, et cetera. So I'm more interested in those kinds of partnerships than I am in like support. You know, I've, I've never said to myself, man, I just, teach me about Islam and support me. I've never said this a day in my life, except to the teacher I actually let me live in the school. <laughs> but mashallah, he did. Alhamdulillah. The next question asks, how did you stay so firm on your dean at your age, at that age? Well, again, I wasn't so firm on my dean at that age. You know, I didn't, I didn't know a lot about Islam. You know, I, I knew that it was something I had committed to, like I'm a Muslim. But my, my practice of Islam came very, very gradually, came very, very gradually. And I wanna emphasize that. Some people tell the story like, they were sitting there with a bottle of wine, 
levitating into the air like the Mi'raj. That didn't exactly happen for me, right? It was this kind of gradual, kind of gaining some, some uh, confidence in my Islam. But once I, once I got to a certain place, alhamdulillah, by Allah's permission, I, I've, I mean, I've, I've had times of greater success and intensity in my practice, more laxity in my practice, like every Muslim. But once I got to a level of, you know, making my prayers and fasting on Ramadan and, you know, giving my zakah and trying to stay away from some of the bigger muharramat, uh, I never, I never backtracked. I never went, I ne never went under that. Mashallah. To, to, you know, the plane had to climb. It took two times. It went down and kind of landed and went, took off again. And, but once we got to a cruising altitude, we we were able to cruise a little bit. Mashallah. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, the question asks, what's your advice if someone doesn't feel like they belong to their Muslim community? Hmm. You know, community is very important. Um, anyone that underestimates the value of community simply doesn't understand its value. You know, if a person, you know, I I've taught, And there's two traits that I see in people that have left Islam, mostly. One, they have very tyrannical fathers, right? They have very tyrannical fathers that when they think about Islam, they think about this very harsh, very controlling, very mean expression of Islam that they've mostly experienced at the hands of their father. That's one. I'm just, just telling it like it is, man, right? The other thing I've seen, they just didn't feel like they belonged to the Muslim community. And it's more like a social apostasy. Actually, they really become agnostic. Like, I, you know, you know, I've only talked to a few Muslims that became like hardcore, died-in-the-wool atheists. Like, I'm an atheist and I'm going to go and proclaim it. Just the people you see on the internet. Like, I am Heresy Ali and the other sister from ex Muslims. And most people, they go from Islam into like a religious malaise. Like, uh, you know, whatever, man. Right? A lot of that is just, I got tired of dealing with Muslims. I just got tired of their judgmental, self righteous crap. And so now the whole religion, the whole I've decided to make that not a really important part of my life. Whatever, man. I'm just not into it, right? If you really get deep with them, and this is where Islam leaves very deep deposits in the souls of people that have been exposed to Islam. You say, you know, I mean, so this new thing that you're doing, you've thought about it and this is the way you want to die? Right? I mean, because when we live and how we live, we make choices about how we want to die. So this new thing you're doing, this, this, is, this, is, this is how you're going out. A lot of them say, I'm not even really thinking about that. Man. So community is very important. Community is very, very important. What I'll say is this. You have not found Muslims that you like. This means you have not found an Islam that you like. And I would urge you to keep looking. To find Muslims that not only it's like, we're brothers, we're sisters. I like this. I like him. I'm talking about brothers and brothers and sisters and sisters, right? If you find a sister that you like, well then, that's an even better conversation. It's time to introduce somebody to parents. It's time to have that. That's an even better conversation. And the way you, some of you guys are smiling, maybe some 
But now you got really nervous. You're like, I, I can't look like that because they're here. No, I, I, I'm just at Mizzou just studying. That's it. Okay. Your secret is safe with me. But finding people that you like, man, it's important. And what I would say is keep looking. Keep looking. You know, the, 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 the Arabic saying is Al Arwah Junud al Mujannada. That souls are like soldiers of a single company. And you have to just find your company. You have to find those people. Some people's like, oh, that's not, that's not it, that's not it. But I would say keep looking. you feel respected by you feel validated by but you can't look for people who crass validation and acceptance you also want people that will push you to be better people that will tell you you know man you you, you really need to work on your temper a little bit right just because Ustaz Obey was killing you on the court like that you didn't have to start cursing like that that was a joke by the way right you still you need, you need good people around you too, but you need to find people that you like, man. And I would just say keep looking. You know, um, I have three children. Uh, my children are sixteen, eight, and six. And for me to believe it too. And yeah, my 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 eldest is is a girl. My, my sixteen year old. I know she sense at some point but right now it's crazy and we're in a mad rush trying to choose colleges and you know all of the insecurity about her appearance and you know, sometimes we drive down the street she spends the entire ride looking at the side mirror I'm like are you going to talk to me? I am talking to you right after I finish curling my eyelashes <laughs> then she has to do the eyebrow. And she may look at me and say one thing. Now she has to redo the skin thing. Then before we get out of the car, she's doing it all over again. I said, subhanAllah. You were born a girl. I still should have named you Yusuf. Subhanallah. Right? So it's crazy. But one of the things that I can between her and her siblings, and I've seen, I've seen this in all people, is that when we're young, like my eight-year-old, my six-year-old, it's very easy to make friends. It's easy. They go to school, it makes no difference. Person Muslim, person of another faith, whatever. You want to be my friend? Okay, I'm your friend. Let's go to the park. See how easy that is? But as you get older, making friends gets harder and harder to where now some people, Drake status, no new friends. No new friends. That, that becomes a thing. No new friends. Why? Why no friends? Why, why no new friends? We did when we were young. Hey, man, you know what? What, what you doing? Let's go, let's go play some ball. Sister, what you doing? You want to work out? It's not a brother saying to a sister. Sister saying to a sister. Right? You want to go work out? Let's go work out. You like movies? New film just came out. Let's go see it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know you guys are Muslims and you don't watch movies. New movie just came out. You want to go see? Let's go see. What? Right. Finding an Islam that you like, man, is about finding Muslims that you like. So I would say keep looking. It's important. It's important. Jazakum Allah. Wassalamu alaikum.